Okay, so let's continue. Um, well, before we resume, let's talk about the questions about exams and stuff like that. Well, there was a question about lecture notes. Like for the last week and this week, I have incomplete lecture notes. Like so, I I hope to well, I probably I have half of it. I, I hope to finish it, but I did not finish because I couldn't finish it. Um, nevertheless, like the chapters in the books. Are extremely well written. Like so, you you could and you should read the book, and I will also release the scribes, like so that you know at least the content of the lecture. Uh, and there was a question about the exam, like what type of questions do we have in the exam, and whether it is like assignment. It is definitely not like assignment. <laughs> so I will not ask you to do programming in three hours. Like so, it's it's going to be uh, like a theoretical exam. Like uh, it's not it's not programming. Like um, well, unfortunately, since this is the first offering of the course, we don't have the sample exams from last year. So, but well, I I could give some sample questions, but I don't want people to overfit to the type of questions that I put in samples. Um, so let us just say you should like if you if you master all the thirteen weeks of lectures. You can do well this. <laughs> so the lecture notes, okay. So whenever there is a lecture notes, lecture notes is enough. Like you don't need to read more than the lecture notes. Like if there is no lecture notes, like look at the scribe and match it with the book. So, so that should be enough. Like so. So what I meant by that, well, of course you have to learn all the thirty weeks. But what I meant by by that is like you just need to learn what is taught. Like you don't need to read extra, uh, and all the optional. All the readings that we have every week, right? Like that I put in the schedule. So those are not for your evaluation. So, so those are for you to learn more. So, so what is there in the lecture is only what I will evaluate you on, but not the extra readings. Okay. Okay, so let's continue. So before the break, we talked about what is a model of the world, like so, so basically. Modeling the next transition, next stage, and next reward, and we also talked about like how to learn the model, like when you could do functional approximators, and like, and we also talked about how to use the model, right? Like, so there are two ways to use the model. Like, so like we are talking about the first way, which is basically use the model to generate simulated transitions. Now, use the simulated transitions to improve your Value-based method or policy-based methods, whatever, right? Uh, the second method, like which we haven't started talking about, is to use the model to do decision time planning. Okay, so we'll come to that a little bit later. Uh, but for now, let's see one concrete. But it's, this is not even concrete, like uh, like the algorithms we've seen before. Like I would not call this an algorithm, like one concrete framework for the type one model-based R. Okay, so so this is called Dyna. Okay, so which basically has integrated planning, acting, and learning. Okay, now, first of all, planning while interacting, right? It's, it's actually a challenging task, and it is also a computationally expensive task. Okay, so because like you have to learn the model of the world, which requires compute, and you also have to take decisions, which requires compute, right? And so now this is a computationally intensive process. So now let's see how to do that. Like uh, in the case of Dyna, okay. So specifically, we're going to look at Dyna Q, which is the idea of using Q learning with model and do all these things simultaneously. Okay, so this is a simple framework. For online planning agent. Okay. Now, so this is how it's going to work. Okay. So there are a lot of pieces here. Like, so let's say you have some value or policy to begin with. It could be a random value function or a random policy function. Okay. Now you act on the world and you are going to get some experience. 
right? Now, in the traditional, like model free methods, you just close this loop by using this experience to learn the value of policy, right? So this is what TD was doing. This is what Monte Carlo was doing, right? So now we are going to call these kind of methods as direct RL methods. Okay, which means there should be an indirect method, right? So the indirect method is to take this experience, okay, and learn a model of the world. Okay, so we're going to go through model learning. Okay, now you use the model with planning to improve your policy. Is that clear? Now, this is direct R and this is the indirect. Is that clear? So in the case of direct oral, like you start with the experience and try to estimate a good value or policy based on the experience. So how would the indirect oral like takes the experience, learns a model, and then uses the model to learn the policy? Is that clear? Now, which is more beneficial? Any years? Should we prefer one over that over another? So, what are the advantages and disadvantages of the direct approach and indirect approach? People can type your answer in chat as well. Yeah. So, direct approach, we don't have to Okay, so computationally direct methods are cheaper. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I think that's a good answer. So in the case of direct R, right? Like so you don't have this model learning phase. So this is going to be computationally simpler approach, right? Like on the other hand, with model-based methods, like indirect R methods, like you have to learn the model of the world, but it might be beneficial in the sense, like once you have a good model of the world, then you can reduce your interactions with the world. And like, you can generate a lot of samples using the model, right? Now, this just means that you can be more sample efficient. Like imagine interactions with the world are costly. Okay, so which is often the case in a lot of um, like critical applications. Okay, so when I say costly, it's not just money, it could also be the dangers and other things. Okay, so now in that case, like if you have a good model, then you can do all your learning the policy in the model space, right? Like so uh, like with, with limited interaction. So so you, you will be more sample efficient because the model is trying to extract as much knowledge from the previous experience. Like on the other hand, like for methods like most of the methods in direct model, like so you don't ex like extract as much knowledge as you can from the experience. So you use the experience, learn the policy and throw away the experience, right? Like so on the other hand, uh, like but the models are actually integrating these knowledge. Like they integrate the experience so that you can generate even more experience. Like, but in simulator sense, of course. Is it clear? Now, there is also another situation where direct RL methods could be better. Like, so for example, imagine that learning a model itself is extremely challenging for a particular application. Okay, so learning a good approximation model is extremely challenging. Okay, so in that case, if you have a poor model, Okay, we will see very soon. Like, so if you have a poor model, you could actually hurt your performance because you will learn suboptimal policies using poor models. So, if you can learn a good model, you do well. If you have poor models, then there are some risks about learning a suboptimal policy. So, model free methods might work better because they don't have this 
biases and errors introduced by this extra model component. Is that clear? Any questions? I think there's a question in the chat. Um, okay, maybe I should close the call just a time so that I see the chat completely. Okay. Um, okay, so there are a few questions. So one is direct approaches need access to the world. Yes, direct approaches need access to the true world, like true, like to the real environment. Um, oh, so there is no difference between direct approach and model free learning. So, so this part, right? This is actually model free. And more, there's a question about whether the model learning generalizes. Yeah, that is another advantage of model based learning. So, if, if you have a good model, then you can generalize to states that you have never seen before, like. You can predict with reasonable accuracy, like so. What would be the reward from the state that you have never seen before? Okay, so that is another advantage. Um, oh, I think that I probably answered the second question already. So the question is: Would it be possible that an environment would be so difficult to model that indirect model wouldn't be applicable? There are a lot of cases where modeling the world is hard. So like the direct approaches are good. Does that? No, not necessarily. So that is where we miss the point, right? Like, so the goal for us is to learn the policy. So, on the other hand, like learning a model introduces extra complications. Like, so there is no reason why you should learn the best possible model to learn the best possible policy. So, like, all you are looking for is like an approximate model that is going to help you. Uh, like learn the optimal policy, right? So you don't need to solve the problem of model learning, like to learn uh, the optimal policy. Okay, so now we're going to talk about DynaQ, okay? So, which is going to combine all these things together and do them in parallel, okay? So like for planning, DynaQ is going to use the random sample algorithm that we have seen before. So random sample one step tabular Q planning. Okay, so the, the, the small algorithm that we saw in the beginning, like so, like we're given a model, you do the Q learning update. So that is the planning algorithm for DynaQ. Okay. Now the direct model method for DynaQ is basically one step tabular Q learning. Okay. Um, but of course, you can have com complex systems for all of these things. Okay. So, like, we are going to take the simplest possible uh, framework. Now, for the model learning, okay. Now, as I mentioned before, you could have a tabular model or you could have linear function approximation or neural networks, right? Like, so now just to make things simpler, like, we are going to have a tabular model. Okay, now this is a deterministic table, okay, which is going to maintain, so given ST and AT, what is the next state and what is the next reward? Okay, ST plus one. Okay, so whenever I see the name, like same next state in action, I will replace whatever next state of reward that I had in my entry with the most recent one. Okay, I'm not even trying to model the distribution here. So this is like a sample model. So like I would just replace the existing next state next reward with the most recent one. Okay, so so anytime you query this model with the state in action, it is going to do a table lookup and tell you, hey, this is the next state and next action. But the big disadvantage here is like this will not generalize, right? Like, so imagine I give you a new state and action. This model will return nothing. Okay. So, however, we will see how to make sure that we never query this model, things that we have never seen before in the algorithm, okay? But nevertheless, this simple model should help us 
understand uh, the idea of learning everything together. Is that clear? Okay, so now let's see how this algorithm would work. So here you have the environment with which your algorithm is abstracting. Okay, so so here you see what like so, so, so this is basically the real experience. Okay, so you directly interact with the environment and you're learning the value function. Okay. Now, whenever you're doing interactions, you can actually do this direct RL upgrade, which is one step Q learning, tabular one step Q learning. Okay. However, I can also in parallel do my model learning component. Like so I can take the real experience and I put it into my model. Okay. Now, so this is where we're going to add a small restriction just to make sure that we don't inquire the model in unseen states. Okay. I'm going to have a search control. Okay. So this search control will make sure that we always start with a state action pair which exists in the model. You randomly uniformly pick one of the state actions from the model. Okay. So starting from that, you're going to do tabular one step Q planning. Okay. So now you can see that there's only one Q function. This Q function is in this root updated using the tabular Q learning, but in this root, it is updated using the tabular Q planning. Right. So now, for example, let's say you want to reduce the amount of interaction with the world, then you could do one episode of tabular Q learning. Then you can do like 50 updates with tabular Q learning. Right. For every one episode of interaction, you could do 50 times or 100 times the tabular Q planning. Okay. So now, between two episodes, right? Like, so in, in the case of model free Q learning, right? Like, so between two episodes, like you are not learning much, but here actually you learn a significant amount of uh, things. Like, we are going to see some examples. Okay. Uh, there's a question in the chat. So, when we overfit in the model, now? so that's a good question. So, well, <coughs> this is a really simple model, right? Like, so, so what we have is a tabular model like so like um, there's not a lot of overfitting that can happen uh, but maybe okay maybe your question was different like so are we kind of overfitting to things that we are just seeing right so it's a deeper question so we are going to spend some time on that soon so so i'll come back to this question what was the idea here so now here is a more solid algorithm. Okay, so we're going to call this as tabular dynamic. Okay, so now you see that you have some Q function that you are initializing, and there is a model which is basically a Q, right? Now you are in the current state. You take an action by using epsilon greedy, so because you're doing Q learning. Okay, now you observe the reward at the next stage, right? Now, step D that you are seeing here. So this is the direct RL update. So you observe the real transition, you take them, you make an update. Okay. Then you go and update your model in step E. So this is the model learning. The clear now once you have the model so let us say i give you a compute budget so i tell you that between each interaction like you can have like two minutes of like off time or before you start interacting with the world again like there's a there is an off time for you okay so depending on how much the time is you can do over this n number of times okay so when you are waiting for the next next action or next state like you could actually do this model like indirect RL update or model based update. 
Okay, so what am I doing here? I'm randomly picking a previously observed state in action. I ask the model, what is the next reward and state for this? Okay, and I do the Q routing update. Now, this algorithm looks similar to something that we have seen before. This is this. Huh? No. No Sarsa, no double Q learning. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of similar to the buffer in DQN, right? Like say, even if, if you remember DQN, like we had this buffer where we were storing all the previous transitions and we were sampling some transitions, right? Now, in this case, like you see that your model, but it so happens that for the tabular case, they are kind of almost similar because in the tabular setting, you have this transition state action, next action reward as a table, right? Like now this table is exactly same as your buffer, right? However, there are some practical differences. Like in the buffer, you store everything, like, but here, like you're replacing and making sure that like there's only one entry for each state of action, but that is a minor difference, right? Like so, but it is, it makes buffer more generalizable in the sense, like in, like imagine your world is stochastic, okay? So then the buffer is going to be much more general than this tabular model because this tabular model can capture only one possible next state of action, like next state of reward, while the replay buffer can actually capture at least a rough distribution of next states and rewards. That's here. Um, other than that, I think you have an online update here, like which you don't have uh, in DQM uh, because we know that online updates destabilizes learning sometimes. Like, so it's just better to break the correlations, right? So, so there are a lot of similarities between tabular Q, Diana Q, and uh, the method like and, and nuclear, okay so however the moment you switch to complex models then that similarity uh fades away so like imagine like i have instead of step e okay imagine i have a neural network which is my model okay so you can you can have an update function for a neural network model okay so then this loop like this particular thing is going to come from a forward propagation of the neural network, right? So, so with the moment you start having a function approximation for the model, then it is not very clear, like, so how is this related to the idea of replay buffer? Uh, but in tabular setting, like specifically in one step tabular deterministic setting, they are, I think if it is one step tabular deterministic, then they are same, right? Like buffer is same as the model. Like, but if, even if it is one step tabular stochastic, they are not same. Is that clear? So any questions? So the, there's a question in the chat. So where are we updating the transition probabilities here? Okay. This is a deterministic model. There is no transition probability. Like, so given a state and action, the model only maintains one next state and one next reward. Any question about data queue? So the reason why I call this as a framework instead of algorithm is because, again, you can change a lot of things here. So, um, like, for example, like you can make the model complex or you could make the directorial update complex, right? Like, so instead of having queue learning, you could have end step queue learning or you could have a poly, you can have, okay, just like how we have tab tabular data queue, you can have a tabular, but not tabular, but with function approximation like dyna acrocritic. Like where you have an acrocritic model, okay, and also some of the updates coming from uh, the model of the world. Okay, so you can combine these things uh, like seamlessly. Any, yeah? Uh, can we understand this uh, algorithm as starting from an action, uh, in the previous situation, state and action, and then simulate the rest of yes that okay so we're going to talk 
in detail about that uh, for the next 15 20 minutes like so the question is can we understand this algorithm as starting from a real state and then like trying to imagine the next uh, states and actions yes like, so we're going to talk about this so, yeah so we what well uh, okay so for the tabular dyna q probably step d is not very crucial but the moment you get into function approximation then probably step d is valuable right like because your all the model based updates are approximates so it really depends on the situation so can we apply this framework with an empty model? So what do you mean by empty model? Oh, we are starting with an empty model. So our, mo our model here is actually an empty table to begin with, and we are adding like the transitions as we go. So, so we are actually starting with an empty model. But if you see the same transition, yeah but there's nothing forcing you to just change it into a distribution right like so but these kind of tabular approaches are not going to be scaling to any interesting problems like so so like there's not it's not that worth to think about this deficiency of just keeping one state okay so it's it's not a big concern like because in practice you will be using function approximation Okay, so now let's see some examples. So here is a simple maze example. Okay, so so here you start here and you end here. Okay, now the reward, there are four possible actions and the reward is going to be zero everywhere except for the goal where it is plus one. Okay. Now this is a discounted problem with gamma is equal to 0 0.95. And we are going to do like both tabular Q learning and also DynaQ. Okay. So here you can see the comparison. Like so in the X axis is the number of episodes. Okay. And in the Y axis is the steps per episode. So, so ideally, if you find the optimal route. You should be able to have finish the episode quicker, right? So if like if you wander around, right? Like if you wander around like this, then your step episode is going to be longer. On the other hand, like if you know what is the shortcut, so I don't know what is the shortcut here, like probably this. Okay, then that is the optimal path, let's say. Like then once you figure out the optimal path, your steps per episode is going to reduce so in some sense this is inverse of rewards okay now you can see that zero like so this is the direct rl method like tabular q learning okay we are comparing this with a dyna q which does five planning steps n is equal to five and 50 planning steps okay you can actually see that with just one episode like the start difference between all the three methods, right? So the tabular Q learning takes approximately 25 episodes to find the optimal policy. Okay, so however, the five planning step algorithm takes roughly three or four, I think five, let's say five episodes and the 50 planning step algorithm actually takes only three episodes to find optimal policy. Okay, now, well, this looks very attractive, right? Like, so now we can speed up things much faster. Like, so we can learn much faster with limited number of samples. So, so however, I should highlight that for a long period of time, like model based algorithms couldn't beat model free algorithms. Okay, so when it comes to real situations with functional approximation. So like in tabular setup, model-based methods 
can't be beaten. Okay, so they are extremely fast and like much more efficient than model free methods. However, the moment you jump into function approximation and like modeling errors and so on, so model based methods were always lagging behind the model free methods. Like, so, like, probably the biggest success for these kind of model based algorithms was like after AlphaGo. Like, so, like, a series of algorithms from DeepMind, like so AlphaGo, AlphaGo 0, and Mu 0, which is a model based algorithm in the year. So, these methods like were able to show like this is like probably like after 20 25 years of model based research right like so, like, so people were able to finally able to show that model based methods could work so so like we're going to see tabular examples here like uh, we will not cover more advanced things like AlphaGo. probably i'll put AlphaGo as a reading um if you are more interested uh, in advanced model based methods okay now at least in tabular case it's, it looks like it works really well okay now what is the intuition behind this right like, so why is it performing that fast but like uh, with that limited samples like, compared to model free methods like so so here is some intuition okay now when you don't have any planning okay so when you just do one step to learning okay after this the, this is the policy that you the algorithm has developed after one episode okay well after one episode the only positive reward that the system got was here right so the only thing that the policy would know is if i am in this particular state i should take up like go up so i reach the goal right now of course if you're using end step they probably let, let's say n is equal to three then probably you would have these three things extra right but look but we are only comparing one step methods here okay now so here is the policy after the same first episode in the, in the middle of second episode okay but for dynaq with n is equal to 50. now you can see that with just one episode dynaq has already figured out most of the space policy right like so like where are, like like this is just after one episode like so after three episodes this algorithm is going to find the best policy so now you can see that you do a lot of meaningful updates with planning uh, which is difficult to do without planning okay so for example when you do one step queue learning so you are going to do one step updates all the way right like so from here to here here to here, here to here, and so on. But they are kind of useless updates, like in some sense, because you are updating the value of the state from zero to zero. Like all these states have zero value, right? Like so only this state has some positive value. It is going to take many, many iterations for you to get non-zero values for other states, right? Like so even though you're doing updates for all the transitions, most of these updates are useless. However, with model based algorithms, these updates actually quickly learn an optimal policy. Is that clear? Okay, there's another question. So, we are learning a deterministic model. After an episode, if we sample from the model, we won't know only the part. Hmm. Okay, so it's an interesting question. The question is if you are learning a deterministic model, after one episode, you only have one episode. So what does it mean to say sampling from the model? Because you'll be sampling the same episode again and again, which is true. Uh, but then the whole point is like you are doing this multiple times. Like, so you will propagate the values quickly, even within that episode. So, which is not possible with one step pure learning. However, like as you increase episodes, you're going to have more transitions in the model of like the tabular model. So you're going to get uh, richer uh, knowledge from that. Any question? Okay, any questions so far? Okay. So this is all good, but there's a catch, right? So the catch is 
this is a very simple deterministic environment and this deterministic model was good enough right so however it is not always possible to learn an accurate model okay now what happens when the model is wrong Okay, now the models could be wrong for several reasons. Like, for example, like one common reason is if the world is stochastic. Okay, if the world is stochastic, your model is already going to have a hard time. Well, let's say you have a deterministic model, there's no way to model the stochastic world. Even for stochastic models, you're going to have a hard time in learning an accurate estimate of this stochastic distribution, right? So this is one source of error in the model, okay? So now there is also another reason like why, uh, like, um, like your model could be wrong. Like, like for example, if you're using functional approximation, So we know that function approximations are kind of approximating things, right? So, so there is also this approximation error that is introduced by your function approximation, right? So now these are two reasons why your model could be wrong. Like now when your model is wrong, right? Like so what happens, right? Like so now whenever your model is wrong and you're learning condition on this wrong model, like you're going to learn a policy which will work for this wrong model. So which means in some sense, you are learning a suboptimal policy, right? So now, if you have an optimistic algorithm, okay, sometimes whenever the model is incorrect, you could discover the issue and correct for it. Okay, so let me give you an example. Let's say my model incorrectly thinks that certain action is a good action. Okay, now this is an error, right? However, I will take that action because my model tells me that I should take this action. So when I take this action, I get a true estimate, which is, let's say bad or worse. Now I will update my model to say that, hey, this is not a good action. So even if the model is erroneous, it will do self-correction, like because the model is tightly linked with my interaction schedule, right? Like, so I'm interacting with the world, also conditioned on the model. So if the model gives me bad suggestions, I'm going to get bad rewards or uh, like negative rewards or like least rewards. I'm like, I'm going to update the model accordingly, right? Now, this is with the assumption that like you have these kind of optimistic errors, right? Like, so if you have, if you don't, like if you have other types of errors, it's going to be very difficult to fix that. So, so how to avoid or how to develop algorithms which can handle imperfect models is still an active research area, okay? So, so there are a lot of algorithms, like, like probably we will not um, talk about uh, all of them today, but you will see a very simple improvement to the model uh, that we have. So that uh, this is actually, uh, so that it actually helps us in some cases, okay? So before that, let's see an example like to demonstrate what I mentioned. So, so here it is the similar like uh, uh, grid world example, okay? Now in this grid world example, like so this is my start, this is my goal. It's same as the previous task, okay? So now you see that probably the optimal thing to do is just, Right, so I'm going to learn with this grid world up to thousand time steps, a thousand episodes, like whatever. Okay, after that, there is a change in the environment. Okay, I'm going to change the grid world then to something like this, where the shortest route that was available before is no, no longer available. So now the model has to take this. 
right? Now, we haven't seen what is DynaQ, so forget about, we haven't seen what is DynaQ plus, so forget about DynaQ plus for now. Just look at how DynaQ is behaving. So it is getting good rewards until this point, right? So then you see that there is a flat Oh. Sorry. Yes. So it takes a lot of extra time to figure out that there is actually this change in the environment. And once it figures out, then it updates its, uh, its uh, policy. Okay. So what we are seeing here is a cumulative reward. So that's why you see that just keeps increasing. Okay. Now, so this is good. It is learning after some point, right? Um, however, so, th so this is an, okay, this is an example for situations where the model can do course correction. Like if, it, if there's a change, if its previous estimate was wrong, in this case, it, ha it happens to be the case that the previous estimate was supposed to be good, but it became bad. So now it is easy for the model to correct. Okay. Now let's look at another example. In this example, model initially has this optimal policy until 3000 steps. Okay. So now we open another route, which is going to be the new optimal route to enter the code. Okay. So now you'll see how DynaQ is performing. You can see the DynaQ never learned that there is a new optimal route. Okay. It just always takes this longest route because like it had an estimate and the estimate happens to be true. Well, then it's good, right? So then why do I change it? However, like what we are looking for is an algorithm which would discover that there is a change in the environment. I should go with that change, right? Now, yeah. For Dyna Q, we, we still had an epsilon greedy. That is right. But remember, epsilon greedy is such a bad. <laughs> exploration algorithm. Well, it's 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 good, but as well as bad, right? Like so maybe, maybe. It, so this is an example where epsilon greedy is there is like it, the probability of epsilon greedy finding this archway to is where like almost zero, right? It's because like when you do when you do epsilon greedy, like so let's say your epsilon is 0 0.01, okay, which is the normal epsilon that we use, just for one percentage of the time, you're going to take one random action. So the probability that this one random action from here, right, goes all the way to here, like is difficult, right? Like, so you could took one random action and come here, but in the next step, your policy is going to say, no, no, go back here, right? So it is actually very difficult for it really to find this new policy, okay? So now this problem that you have, like when your model, um, like kind of overfitted to what existed before, but like doesn't learn new things, right? Like so now this is again, the classical exploration versus exploitation. Dilemma. But this time for models, okay? Now, the models that we are going to learn will always have this dilemma, like, I know some best estimates. Should I just continue to follow this? Or in other words, should I exploit my current knowledge about the world so that I can get good rewards? Or I take exploratory actions, okay, for the sake of learning new things in the world, in the world which is going to, which might hurt my performance, right? So for example, like when you have, when you have already found that this is the optimal route, what is your incentive to try other routes? 
right? So every time you try to take this particular route, it's a different color. Every time you try to take this particular route, okay, or let's say, let's say specifically this particular route, right? It's going to hurt your cumulative reward, right? <coughs> so now why should a model take this route, right? So, so that is the exploration issue here, right? So now the models have to take, like, like basically you have to take it. Previously, if you need to take exploratory actions in model pre oral because like, we want to find what are the best possible actions, right? Similarly, even for models, we have to take exploratory actions because we want to update our model with new things or new changes that happen in the world. Okay. So far in this course, like so we always dealt with simple grid world environments where things don't change, right? Real world is not like that. So in real world, things change all the time, right? Like imagine you have a uh, trash collecting robot in this classroom okay so like today the projector is there right like, so tomorrow the projector might be actually here which blocks the way so suddenly there is a new block right like so now how would this algorithm update itself so that instead of going like that it should come all the way like this right so now this requires some constant exploration okay now how do we do that so there are countless methods to do that. Okay, so we will not talk about all of them, but we are going to talk about this really simple method, which we call as DynaQ plus. Okay, so DynaQ plus is really simple. So what DynaQ plus is going to do is in the table that we have, right? For every st at st plus one rt plus one, right? So in the table. Okay, now instead of just keeping the state action pair, I'm also going to keep the time lapse. Okay, so how much time has lapsed since I visited, last visited the state? Okay, so let us just call this as tau. Okay, now whenever I do updates, using this table transitions instead of updating with just reward r i want to consider the reward from the state is not just r but r plus k times square root of tau so what is the effect so the effect is as the time lapse increases like as as it gets as, 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 it takes, as it gets more time, like since I visited a state, I'm going to artificially increase the reward for the state so that my policy is tempted to go to the state. Well, of course, when it goes to the state, it figures out that the reward is not true, but the advantage is we learned something about the state once again, right? So like, for example, now let's go back here, right? So think about this particular state, the blue thing. Right? So this state, let's say you visited in the beginning, after 1000 iterations, like after 1000 steps, the reward that you, that the model claims from that state is going to increase. So you will again visit there. This time you will figure out that, hey, there's actually this extra route that I could take. And this actually takes me to the goal much shorter. So I can update my code policy. Is that clear? A very simple update, like now we can actually encourage exploration throughout, right? So this is also like Epsilon BD in the sense you're getting constant exploration. Uh, but this constant exploration uh, is um, like, is already sufficient for simple pro like problems like this, okay? So have we seen anything like this before? Yeah, UCP, right? So UCP let me encourage exploration uh, by having this extra term. So the, the kappa that you see here, K or kappa, like so that is basically the constant which decides how much you importance you give for exploration. 
So, so here you can see that Diana Q plus actually figured out that there is a shorter policy. So its cumulative reward is actually getting better than Diana Q. So in this case, you see that Diana Q like actually also learns Diana Q plus actually also learns better than Diana Q, even for like the harder problem, like which is well, even for the, the normal problem, like where like you know, your model was optimistic in the beginning. Is that clear? Okay, so probably we will stop here and continue after the break. There's a, there are questions in the chat, but I'm going to take that after the break. Thank you.